when I ask people what makes you think that the, your idea is good, I hear a variety of forms of evidence. One is I think it's good, self-conviction. I'm a smart guy. I'm experienced. I've done this for many years. So I'm pretty sure it's a good idea. And in my calculator, in my confidence meter, it gives you 0.01 out of 10 simply because I was in this position. I was convinced and I convinced other with rhetoric that it's a great idea, but opinions are just very unreliable source of, uh, of evidence. And every terrible idea out there, someone thought it was great and managed to convince other people that it is great. So it's just not enough. Welcome to the Product Development Podcast. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Itamar Gilad, a speaker, coach, and author, recently publishing his book called Evidence Guided. Itamar was previously uh, in senior product and engineering roles at Microsoft and Google, and has worked for a number of other startups as well. Itamar, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Great. Well, um, as a means of a bit more introduction, can you maybe take the listeners through a bit more about your background and also what, what was the impetus for writing evidence guided where did it come from so the the short version of my biography is that uh, i i used to be an engineer i worked uh, i rose through the ranks of engineering for five or six years then i switched to product management where i spent about 15 years mostly in uh, small and medium-sized companies in israel where i'm from but also in some large internationals, Microsoft and Google. At Google, I spent about six years and I worked as a product manager for Gmail mostly. And in the past six plus years, I've been coaching and guiding product organizations and talking about basically the things we're going to talk about in this podcast. Uh, the book is a recent thing. I just published it last month. Uh, so quite exciting. I've been working on it for a number of years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and why the book? Um, basically, because throughout my history, I discovered that I'm not creating as much impact as I expected. Uh, a lot of my projects were very disappointing. Uh, and, and it's not because of lack of uh, intention or hard work. It's just that we chose the wrong ideas. So that kind of motivated me to go on a journey of discovery that took me through Google and then later on with my clients. And I concentrated a lot of what I learned in that book called Evidence Guided. So, so the extra stories you talk about earlier on, you mentioned that the Google Plus and Gmail integration and the kind of the bad ideas you alluded to there. Yep, take, take us through that story a little bit more. For sure. If you're not familiar with the background, Google Plus was Google's attempt in the early 2010s to compete with Facebook by launching a, essentially a Facebook clone with a Google flavor called Google Plus. And it was the pinnacle of Google's strategy. It was a whole new division that had, I think, close to a thousand people. And it didn't just involve launching that new social network, but also connecting every other part of Google, YouTube, Search, uh, Maps, and also Gmail, where I worked, uh, to Google Plus and bringing elements of Google Plus into Gmail and making the whole thing work as one whole. and we felt this was a good idea because we, most of us, liked the product. We used Google Plus internally before it was launched. We used it as consumers ourselves. And yeah, it made sense to connect Gmail with Google Plus, and we happily worked on this. Uh, I think the, the integrations continued for a couple of years. And Google Plus itself was churning features and redesigned. And at the end of the day, none of it actually mattered that much because except for a small minority of enthusiasts, most users actually didn't use Google Plus that much and naturally also the Gmail integrations. And partly because they just didn't need another social network. Turns out it was a great idea for Google maybe, but not for, the, for Google's users. And um, Specifically within Gmail, a lot of users gave us the feedback that they didn't like this mix of personal and social. For them, mm -hmm. Gmail was a personal thing where they maintained their messages. They didn't want Google Plus to trickle into it. Um, so those were key learnings that we probably should have learned earlier. So this was an example of a very big project with a lot of satellite projects that led to very little impact. And 
we unlaunched most of the Google Plus uh, integrations from Gmail after a number of years, and Google Plus itself shut down in 2019 after about nine years after being launched. And even more worryingly, while we were doing all this work, much smaller companies like WhatsApp, like Snapchat, like Instagram, actually achieved a lot more in the social space and actually became the threat to Facebook mm -hmm. that Google Plus aspired to be. And we missed this opportunity of social mobile apps completely. Yeah, it's funny how the, the internal information can be so different from the external information sometimes. You have all your biasing. I know you touched, touched on that in the book as well. Um, but just to kind of move forward to the, the other sort of good side of Google projects that you've worked on, I know you talk about the, the tabbed inbox in, to, in, in the book. So maybe you can guide us through that story. So that was another large project, not as large, of course, much smaller, but it, it was a re major redesign of the inbox in Gmail that I took part in. Um, and by the way, my criticism of Google Plus is not that we, we, we did a big project or that we were ambitious, but it was that we relied a lot on our opinions rather than on mm -hmm. actual data, on actual evidence uh, re with respect to our hypothesis and what we thought the market needs and uh, and so on. So in this case, uh, it started differently. I, uh, I came with this idea to reorganize the inbox to kind of get rid of a lot of the noisy email, you know, commercial notifications, promotions, social notifications. Again, this was the early 2010s, and a lot of people were getting a lot of these things into their inbox and didn't really know how to manage them. Um, so I presented this idea to my management and to my team, and no one got excited about it. And they all had very good reasons. They said, we tried this before. We have at least five or six different features already launched to help people manage their inbox. Why do you think your, your idea is good? And what problem are you trying to solve anyway? Um, because it wasn't clear that that was really a major problem in the lives of most casual users. I experienced it in my inbox, but maybe I was atypical. So that sent us on a voyage of initially research, both quantitative and then qualitative, and then a series of iterations of actually trying to come up with some ideas. We discovered it was a major problem, and then we iterated on a number of ideas, and then we landed on one that was actually performing extremely well, which was to separate the inbox into tabs by email category. So we had a tab for primary, which was for interpersonal communication, we had a tab for um, social and, and another for promotions. There are a couple uh, more that you can enable in uh, settings. And that tested extremely well in user testing and later on in dog food, which was internal testing and, ex and broad uh, external tests. And in general, it was a very powerful idea. Uh, but we had to refine it. We had to change the plan multiple times to redesign it. And gradually it grew, it's, it started in the desktop, then it trickled into the mobile and iOS apps, which wasn't in the plan, but we realized it's even a bigger problem there. And then it became this major launch for Gmail, like one big major launch for all the Gmail clients. And it turned out to be very impactful, partly because we didn't have so much confidence in it. And we tested it so rigorously, we discovered so much, we iterated so much. So when you do these things, when you launch, you're not surprised. You're not disappointed because you pretty much know what to expect. So what did the timeline look like from that initial idea of, you know, you coming in and saying, I've got a, an idea how we can maybe solve this problem in a better way than we're doing at the moment, all the way to doing the, the first kind of rolls out to the, the wider public? You know, what, what did that timeline look like for that project? Depending how you measure, it was between 12 and 14 months, mm. which... I know sounds huge, but in Gmail terms, it's it's actually not that massive because Gmail is a mission critical service for a lot of people. And when you change something in Gmail, you, you change both client side, front end and back end. And there are a lot of implications to test against. Uh, so it took a while just on on this aspect. Plus we had to reinvent the feature multiple times. We with each round of testing, we learn new things that, like, for example, we, we needed to deal with cases where, I don't know, someone got a password reset message and it had to be in primary. Yeah, it, it took a while, 
but I think in this case, it was both a big idea, expensive to implement and risky. So in these cases, I think you should take your time. Mm. When you're testing ideas that are either cheaper or less risky, you can go much faster, of course. I guess we'll get onto that when we get to the, uh, the steps part of the framework as well. But um, yeah, to take all that background then and put it into the, the meta framework, which you've called GIST, um, do you want to provide a bit of a brief overview in terms of what the framework tries to achieve? And then we can dive a bit into the constituent parts of, of that. Yeah, so working in Google and enjoying the Google DNA of um, you know being evidence-guided and data-centric, um, a lot of things come naturally. Like you don't think about them, but they just work. Uh, empowered teams and all that good stuff. But stepping into the outside world and starting to coach product organizations, I realized a lot of these things were not in place. Um, I gradually started to construct um, a framework, which I call GIST, that kind of breaks the problem into four parts, four manageable parts that you can change in every company and you don't necessarily have to change them all at the same time and the four are goals which are basically the outcomes you're trying to achieve ideas which are hypothetical ways to achieve the goals and the challenge there is to choose the ideas correctly or to evaluate and pick the right ideas steps which is about building and learning at the same time and feeding this uh, evidence into your decision and finally tasks which is about integrating the workflow of the team, which is usually Kanban or uh, Agile, with this new kind of experimental model. So it's a framework that I started using with my clients and we gradually, based on feedback, improved it. And eventually it, it became the thing that I wrote about in the book. So, so what was the timeline for this in itself in terms of the, the development from the first idea that you want to come up with a new framework that combines all the best bits of learnings that you've had into something that you can apply to future projects and businesses. You know, how long was that period? Was it sort of five years, six years? I mean, how long did it take you to get to from that first point to, I suppose, publishing the book? So some ideas existed with me for a very long time. And of course, all of this is, is based on the work of much smarter people than me as well. I, I was inspired by a lot of, uh, writers like uh, Marty Kagan and Eric Ries and others. Uh, so I cannot take the credit for most of it. Um, in Google, it kind of germinated. It kind of started, I started noticing some patterns about why Google is different and was able to succeed so much, like the element of goals or the element of being very um, data-driven. And I started using the network, the framework, I think, as early as 2017. And the book was published in 2023. So about six years. The book itself took four and a half years to write because I, I thought I understood it already a year and a half into it, but I had my own discovery to do. So before we break down each each, each part specifically, um, just keen to get a, a distinction between when people say they're guided by data or data-driven companies, what is the difference between that and being evidence-guided? Is there a distinction? How would you articulate that? So those are, I think those are distinct terms and they're both important. Being guided by data is being well instrumented, collecting a lot of data, looking at charts, looking at, uh, at trends, meeting regularly and discussing data, running experiments with data. Data is important. Data shows you kind of where are things going, but data alone doesn't necessarily confirm or refute hypothesis. That's evidence. So if you find data and you can interpret it, it tells you a story about something you care about, about some idea you have, that becomes evidence. And evidence is much more precious. Most data doesn't tell us a story. It's just, it's just numbers and facts. Distilling data into evidence is an art form that uh, a lot of companies struggle with. Mm. And that's why we have data science, etc. In terms of then goals, you know, when you say goals, what, what comes to your mind? What are the constituent parts of goals? I know there's a bit of a hierarchy to them. So can you take us through what that looks like in the framework? For sure. So let's start with what usually happens in companies. Usually at the top level, there are some business goals like revenue, market share, etc. Below that, there are siloed goals. We have the marketing goals, the development goals, the product goals. Each one is kind of 
somewhat separate. They're all supposed to align, but they don't. And a lot of it is about doing work. It's about let's do this project, let's run these marketing campaigns, let's do that or the other. This is what we call output goals. Um, and that is kind of missing the point because the goals are not supposed to be like a plan of action. The goals are supposed to say, what are we trying to achieve by the end of the goal cycle? At company level, it's usually the end of the year. At uh, team level or mid-level, it's usually uh, quarterly. You know, the OKR cycle, if, if you're familiar with that. Um, and the goals themselves in what I consider evidence-guided companies or data-driven companies, whatever you want to call it, are based on models. They're not based on the company structure necessarily, but it's based on a model that explains how the company is growing growing both the value it delivers to the market, and that's very important to, to measure, but also the value it captures from the market. And throughout the book, I try to emphasize this duality because in many companies, the main goals are about business success, and that's not enough. Business success usually stems from the fact that we're able to deliver more and more value. So I present a model called the value exchange loop. For each side of the exchange, I give uh, a metric, the, biz the top business metric versus the North Star metric, which measures the total amount of value. And I'm giving a, some examples of that. And those can be broken into submetrics or metrics trees, which are supporting metrics that if you influence them, they will influence the top metric. Those, of course, are lagging um, metrics. It's very hard to change the top business metric, like revenue, or the top uh, or the North Star metric, like number of messages sent or number of uh, transactions. So you need to break them into something you can more readily control. And then when you have this hierarchy of metrics, you can assign metrics to teams and they can have a sense of ownership and mission. And it's pretty clear what part of the tree the search team is controls and what part of the tree the onboarding team controls. That's really helpful for also alignment because everyone is pulling in the same direction at the, at the end of the day. it's funneling this value exchange uh which is the core of the mission of the company mm. i historically i've always found north star a kind of problematic metric to to nail and get it correct i think understanding what single metric you can track that is essentially going to show that the customer uses extracting maximum value you know how to gauge that from a single thing um i mean can you give some tips in terms of you know good north stars and good top business metric potentially based on some examples um and even what you know bad north star metrics and bad goals look like because uh, i think it's pretty good to think of what bad examples could be so um the north star metric needs to be purely about value delivered so let's look at an example um Airbnb measures numbers of nights booked. Why? Because it's a platform. It is, it's a two-sided marketplace that needs to connect supply and demand. And the number of nights booked shows how much the supply meets the demand, how much both sides are benefiting from the platform. So if we double the number of nights booked over the course of a year, you can generally say we doubled the value we created for these two types of uh, customers. Uh, so that's very important to have this definition. What is the core value that they're seeking? How can we measure it? It needs to be an absolute. So if you start turning it into a fraction, uh, it's A, harder to see the difference year over year, and B, you can manipulate it more just by filtering some of the bad customers and uh, all of a sudden your number goes better. Uh, so it needs to be an absolute unlike most of the metrics that we do track that are usually fractions or ratios. And another uh, anti-pattern is to complicate it, to try to make it a perfect metric or try to combine multiple metrics into a formula or to try to sneak in revenue in there. It's, yeah, it's the night's book, but only the ones we make a lot of money off, for example. That is kind of conflating the, the, the two sides of the, the value exchange and also complicating the metric, and then people don't understand it. No one understands it except maybe the CFO and CPO, so it's not motivating them. It's not actually driving them to action very efficiently. So it's better to keep it simple and understandable. Mm. You, my understanding is, I think Facebook uses weekly active users as their North Star, I believe, and I, I, was, I was curious on that as well because I always thought that potentially just having 
how many people are using something. Is that the best indicator? I've always been kind of curious on that because I wonder if people are using it, but they're not really engaging with it. So is an engagement metric better than just a, they'd log on and you know click off straight away? I'm keen to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, weekly active users. I think they switched to weekly people, active weekly people, people right. uh, to, to differentiate from robots and other mm. uh, agents on the system. Uh, I'm not a big fan, partly because active can be any number of things it's it's really a very very gener general purpose uh, metric um we learn in, in gmail that people can become active for the wrong reasons for for example if you sign up to a newsletter that is very insistent and keep popping up in your inbox and you open your inbox just because of this noise that makes you active but it's not necessarily means that you're getting a lot of value from the product so um activity i think is a fallback you should use it as your nostal as like a last resort. If you are doing creating value in so many different ways that you cannot pinpoint the, the exact one, and then you're just falling back to activity. I think Facebook would have maybe benefited from having something much more pinpointed and concrete, and that would have maybe saved them of some of the, um, the trouble they got into mm -hmm. later on, um, finding that all sorts of negative elements were actually exploiting the system uh, to drive activity that wasn't necessarily positive. Mm. So once you established your goals and making sure that they're good goals and not bad goals, good and not stars, etc., where do you pick the right ideas? How do they come about? How do you know that they're the right ideas? So I will qualify that often the next step is research. Uh, if you have a mm. goal and you are not sure how to achieve this goal, you don't understand the context enough, you let's say you want to reduce customer churn, but you don't know why cu customers are churning, the right thing to do is probably to do some research, in this case, user research. Or if you need, you have a goal to, um, to launch in new countries, you need to understand in which countries there is a demand right now, et cetera. So sometimes the, the right thing to do is to have some research and that research will drive ideation and, and give you some ideas. In many cases, we already have the ideas because the ideas are coming from the customers or the ideas are coming from the team or we already did the research in the past. We have enough knowledge to go directly from goals to ideas. Both options are le legitimate. Um, so ideas are hypothetical ways to achieve the goals. And when we say ideas, it could be launching a feature, it could be finding a new partner, it could be using a new technology. All of these things, whatever it, it takes to just get to, to that achievement that we set in the goal. And I would argue any source of idea is legitimate, even if it comes from the assistant QA person, but they, they can give you a tremendous idea, sometimes better than the SVP. And it can come from external, it could come internally. I think we should be responsible respect of all ideas, collect them in idea banks, but then very, very efficiently just come through them, evaluate them and park most of them. Yes. Yeah, speaking to my experience, uh, I mean, one thing I created uh, a while back was just a place that I invite the entire business to say, this is a board for everyone. Everyone is welcome to contribute ideas. There's a template in terms of how they structure their, their thoughts. And it was used by many people in the business from tiny little things, even just little bug reports, all the way to big feature ideas that come across in terms of they think there's this issue with the system and they think this is the way that they could solve it. Um, and it's been really vital in terms of getting a good understanding of where all the stakeholders across the business come in. And I think I definitely advocate for giving everyone in the business a voice. I think it's a really positive thing to culturally as well in a business, for sure. I would caution against just allowing people to enter ideas directly into your, your idea bank. I think putting up a form and then you review the form and then you discuss this with the people is maybe slightly better. Um, otherwise, if, if you just make it a suggestion box, it will explode very quickly. Yes. So it, it, in my side, I, I do make sure it's organized in a way that there's a, a sort of system from the left side, which is very disorganized, lots of ideas put together, and then essentially they're vetted by myself and some other key stakeholders, which they're dragged across to a, a to discuss kind of column, I suppose, at that point. And um, yeah, but certainly just inviting that and making sure that everyone feels like they, they can have a voice, at least, even if it goes nowhere. I think that's a great thing to have. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think of ideas like I think of bugs. Anyone can open a bug in your system. That's the, the idea. But then you need to triage them very quickly and decide in a very transparent way why this idea we're not going to evaluate further or work on right now, and then reduce it to a much smaller set of kind of candidate ideas that you are willing to consider. So, so let's talk through that process then. I know in the book you talk about the ICE uh, process of doing prioritization. So um, for those who don't use it, or maybe you can kind of touch upon your personal thoughts on applying ICE in terms, in terms of prioritization. So I use more the term evaluation rather than uh, prioritization in this case. Um, I th simply because I think we should consider each idea just on its own, not just how it compares to others. Um, so ICE prioritization or evaluation basically tries to ask three questions about the idea. The first one is impact. How much do we think it stands to contribute to the goals? So if, whether it's reducing churn or improve shortening the, cost, the onboarding time or whatever it is, the metric that we're trying to, to, to change, how much it, is this idea on a scale of zero to 10? And initially it's a guess. I'll explain later if you like how we improve this guess. Uh, the second is, um, well, the third is ease in ICE. Ease is like the opposite of effort. If an idea is super easy to implement, let's say a couple of weeks, the whole thing is built. I'm not talking experiments or anything. Just if we build the whole thing, start to finish production ready. Two weeks may be super easy. That's a 10. 30 weeks, that's not easy at all. We'll give it a, a two. Each team, of course, has different velocities, so they need to construct their own uh, scale. You can use just a five-point scale if you prefer t-shirt sizes, but just translate them to a number. And uh, those are the two classic components, impact and effort or impact and ease. And this is how we've done prioritization for a very long time. But, and that's a tribute to Sean Ellis, the, the growth guru, who started using this method for um, growth experiments, but then we imported it into product. He added a third element called confidence. And confidence tried to answer a very simple question. How sure are we that the impact and the ease are what we expect? If we say it's a five and a two, why do we think it's a five and a two and not a nine and a six? What, what convinces us? And, and that's a very important question to ask because we can easily dilute ourselves and go into completely random numbers. I've seen, I've done it myself um, many times. So taking the each of those a little bit further then you talked about impact and starting with a bit of a guesstimate can you explain what comes after the guesstimates um you know what, how do you get to a more concrete impact number so in the triage i think you should guesstimate maybe just the pm alone or together uh with the other leads um because each team needs to do its own idea bank and its own triage process and that's just a quick filter um, some ideas, by the way, you cannot say no to. Even if they look very bad with the ice core, if they come from the senior VP, so you need to respect that. But that's okay. You're, you're not going to build now the whole thing for nine months. You're just moving it a step further. Next goes, uh, usually, either you reflect on similar ideas in the past, and that sometimes bring into your memory some constraints or benefits. Uh, but even better is to do some sort of model, some sort of analysis on paper. You can break the guess of impact sometimes to sub-guesses, doing a fun ana analysis or something like that. And those smaller guesses are usually easier to, to do. For example, if I think that uh, showing a promo will get more people to buy, I can ask myself first how many people will see the promo during the time that it is shown. How many will actually have the need to buy when they see it? How many will convert? How many? How much will they buy? And that gives me a more elaborate model. Uh, and usually, it it gives us a better assessment. So that's step number two. So in, initially, you spent thirty seconds. Now you, you spent five minutes. Uh, and then, if it still looks good, you will go further into steps into evaluating it by building versions of it and putting it in front of users conceptually or the real thing and measuring the results. And that really is the way to really improve your impact assessment and kind of validating the assumptions within the idea. On to the next point in terms of the, the confidence. I know you've got a, a confidence calculator model. 
you want to take us through what that model looks like and you know how you, how you're calculating confidence on ideas? So confidence comes from evidence. Um, what evidence do we have to support our assumption that this is a great idea? That it's going to be a seven of impact and two of ease. It's like super high impact and really easy. And when I ask people what makes you think that the, your idea is good, I hear a variety of forms of evidence. One is I think it's good, self-conviction. I'm a smart guy, I'm experienced, I've done this for many years, so I'm pretty sure it's a good idea. And in my calculator, in my confidence meter, it gives you 0.01 out of 10, simply because I was in this position. I was convinced, and I convinced others with rhetoric that it's a great idea, but opinions are just very unreliable source of, uh, of evidence. And every terrible idea out there, someone thought it was great and managed to convince other people that it is great. So it's just not enough. Moving further, you can connect it to some theme. Maybe it's a buzzword in the industry right now, you know, generative machine learning or the strategy of the company. That's just opinion on a larger scale. Moving a bit further, you can do reviews with your colleagues, with experts, and they might find flaws in the idea, but still it's opinions. They are not the, the target customer usually. So what they tell you is not necessarily indicative of the truth. It's slightly higher confidence, but not necessarily. Then there are those uh, projections or back of the envelope calculations that we've done. And there are various forms that gives you a little bit more confidence. A lot of ideas actually die at this level because once you start doing the numbers, you realize they're not as strong as they're supposed to be. And that's great because you can put this idea aside and move on to another idea. That's a really cheap way to eliminate ideas. Then you move into data. You're still not building and testing. You're just looking at available data. This data can be quantitative or qualitative, and it can come in two forms. It can be anecdotal. So I spoke to a bunch of customers, and a couple said, you know, sounds good to me. I would really like this. Or um, I looked at some competitors, and the leading competitor has the same feature. That sends a signal that someone on the outside world is actually interested, but it doesn't necessarily send a very strong signal because it's anecdotal. And our minds construct patterns in the noise very easily. Um, so we should be very cautious of assigning too much confidence to evidence. I think when you find anecdotal evidence, it's about one out of 10. That's how far you got in the confidence level. Unfortunately, in a lot of companies, if they think it's a good idea, opinions, and the leading competitor has this feature, that's the end of the validation. They go ahead and build the whole thing. Uh, but I think you should go further. So further means finding market data, which is bigger data sets through surveys, through smoke tests, through deep competitive analysis, et cetera. And then you can go even further by doing deep user research, deep data analysis, usability tests, um, deep user interviews, et cetera. Uh, and those things give you more market data and you learn a lot from them. So they give you more confidence. We're edging on three. And the last step is really hard tests, where you build a version of the of the product and let people use it for a while. MVPs, alphas, labs, there's a bunch of those betas. And eventually this gives you medium high confidence. And the plan, the, the point is to know when to stop, not to do this for every idea because it's very expensive to go all the way up. But for those ideas like the tabbed inbox that I told you about, you should go all the way up to, to high confidence. Mm. What, what is the confidence rating that is that kind of blue blue tick to say, yeah, okay, it's we're confident enough now that this is going to be worth the effort to, to implement. Is, is there a, a, a sweet spot in that confidence meter? Uh, it varies by the idea. Uh, if it's a small idea and not risky, let's say you decided to change the font in some page or you, uh, you decided to reorder the settings, Sometimes just expert opinion is enough. Like you reviewed it, the the design lead thinks it's a good idea. Let's just do it. You can test it with other changes. Uh, it's not very risky and it's pretty cheap to do. So no point in going into an elaborate A-B experiment on this. And probably you will not get any results, significant results, because the data will be just inconclusive. If the idea is small but risky, 
there's a temptation to say let's, let's just launch it and we will see what happens but that's actually doing a 100 percent a b experiment you're testing on all all your users with no control and that's very risky because sometimes you will realize months or years later that this thing actually hurt you so i would go a little bit higher and go at least i don't know around three or three plus like medium medium low confidence with this sort of uh, experiment usually you want to if you can run a high confidence test like an a b experiment or early adopter program depending if you're b2c or b2b for a big and risky uh feature you need to go much higher than that and test it with multiple forms it's not just a linear line you need to test all your assumptions and with each assumption you might find different levels of confidence so it's a much bigger task to do but it's worthwhile doing because you're saving yourself both risk and the, the the chance of launching the wrong thing that no one actually needs which is the more common problem earlier on when you talk about the tabbed inbox you mentioned i think it was dog food uh, which is the, the google term isn't it for internal testing what other processes were there in taking it increasing the confidence of that feature into gmail you know what, what was the other steps that you took not to kind of jump to the steps too quickly uh, which we'll get on to but um, what were they at google for the, the tabbed inbox our earlier research, we, we did a deep data analysis of how people manage their inbox, just looking at the data and seeing what kind of actions people do. And we focused on consumers, not business uh, users, who tend to be much more proficient uh, in inbox management. Uh, and we found they're basically doing nothing. Most of them are just letting the email pile up. And we looked also on the size of the inbox, and we found people with hundreds of thousands of unread messages in the inbox, for example. Then we did uh, interviews and we asked people to show us the, the inboxes and we, we learned how difficult it was for them to find what they needed in the inbox. We did a lot of usability tests for various ideas in prototype. It, it was kind of a uh, Wizard of Oz, for example. The tab, the inbox, the first version, it functioned, but it was just a facade. It wasn't really Gmail. We, we created the tabs and while the interview the the user researcher was interviewing the, the the participant some of us moved copied from their inbox with permission because they they gave us permission at the beginning not knowing exactly what they're giving permission to but uh, we just copied the sender and subject into the right tab and then the the tester or the, the user researcher told them can you please look at this and then there was their inbox organized by category into the tabs and the initial reaction was 10 out of the 12 loved it to bits and really said, I, I need this. This is something they didn't know that they can have, but they really needed and they really loved it. And that gave us a very strong signal. The other two, while they were consumers, they already knew how to use labels and filters and other mechanisms of Gmail. So they found this feature unnecessary. And what we learned throughout this uh, voyage in the next 12 months was that most of the Googlers were like this, and especially my colleagues at Gmail, they were very proficient and they cleaned their inboxes very diligently. And most of the tech press, for example, when we released this feature for them for review before they actually launched, most of them were kind of, meh, it's not for me. But that was because we didn't build it for them. We built it for the 85% of people who were very lazy about managing their inbox. I was one of them, by the way. Uh, so um, this this is, this is was a very important test for us. Then we did much larger uh, longitudinal tests where we allow them, people to use this for a duration of weeks, more usability, large scale uh, dog food. The list goes on. Even the release itself was a, a sort of test. Mm. So taking those concepts and experiments and tests, which I think do form keep key steps uh, which we'll get onto now so what are steps you know you, you've got your ideas you've got the goals where do you where, where do steps come in in the framework so presumably you found some ideas that look good and uh, after evaluation what do you do next the temptation is to build a whole thing and to build it around some um, engineering milestones you know milestone one milestone two design milestone integrations maybe you bake into it one usability test and after that you launch uh, but that's actually just focusing on 
output. You you assume the idea is good and you just try to rush it out the door as, as soon as possible. What I suggest, and it's of course not my original idea, it's, if you read the Lean Startup or uh, Inspired, you will find that same idea and in design thinking, et cetera, is to combine building with learning. And the element of doing that is the step. A step builds the idea somewhat, develops it somewhat, sometimes just on paper, just in concept, just as a prototype, just as an early walking skeleton, and tests it and gives us evidence. So each step ends in a learning milestone. We learn something we didn't know. We confirm some of our assumptions or we reject them. And the trick is to learn how to build and learn at the same time. Because a lot of companies see this as two contradicting things. Either we do learning or we build. We cannot do the same. And I believe we should do we should become proficient in doing both at the same time. What are some example steps that people can kind of visualize in terms of what what that actually look like on on this board, that that just board? So um Again, I, I looked for different ways to validate assumptions and ideas, and I didn't find anything that was really satisfying for me and, and conclusive. So I created my own little chart or model that you can find in the book, which I call after. Assessment, fact-finding, uh, tests, experiments, and release results. So the early steps, we talked a little bit about them. There are the initial ice analysis, uh, reviewing with experts or with stakeholders, individually, one-on-one -on -one, uh, is better. Then after that, you have uh, fact-finding, which is looking at data. It could be anecdotal or could be uh, higher volumes of data. And then you move into tests. And in tests, you're building versions of the idea and putting them in front of users, measuring the results. But of course, the early tests are about faking the idea, not really building it. So many usability tests are actually based on prototypes. We talked about Wizard of Oz. That's what we did for Gmail. You can do concierge tests. You can do fake door tests, or um, uh, sometimes they're called painted door tests. Basically, we bring people to a position where they can opt into the product, either in a landing page or in a pop-up inside your product. And you just check if they have the intent, if they're actually interested in this thing that you're telling them about. The next level of steps uh, is about testing, but already with real code. So we're building something that is rough. It's not scalable. It's not polished. It's It doesn't support all the core functions necessarily, just the main, main things. But we're giving it to users to start using and to get uh, feedback. So this could be early adopter programs, alphas. MVP usually refers to this kind of uh, thing. Then you have late stage tests, betas, labs, previews, et cetera, which are almost the complete thing, more like a dress rehearsal. Then you have experiments, which are tests that have a control element. So it's basically split tests, um, A-B experiments, multivariate, et cetera. Some companies run every change through them because they have a lot of data, usually commerce companies or Netflix is an example of that. And finally, the release itself, you can, do gradual release and do kind of a mega size A-B experiment, if you like, and just to, to test that you're not messing up something. So those are, that's kind of the gamut. What do you say to PMs out there who would say, that's that sounds all great, but I'm essentially just doing so much execution. I don't have time for research. I don't have time to you know, apply all these different levels of steps to get to our end point. I have... Demands from above, I know you mentioned it earlier, um, you know, customers are getting angry because they requested this feature six months ago, um, et cetera, et cetera. How do you, how do you cope with that in, in a business, uh, particularly, I suppose, in smaller businesses as well, with just a, a leaner team? I think the whole stack needs to help you, um, but you need to decide where to start. One failure could be in the fact that the goals are not well-defined. If the goal is just deliver whatever the customers are asking for, then you're not really a product team, you're a services team and you're just building one-offs at a very cheap price, by the way. Um, if the problem is that any idea that comes from a stakeholder or from a manager needs to go into this convoluted road mapping process and eventually we spit out way too many ideas that more than the team can handle and the team is in a fixture factory, you have a, 
a problem at the ideas level. Your prioritization or evaluation is not functioning. Uh, and the, in the task layer, which we are getting to now, usually there's another problem, which is it's assumed that the team is working in this agile delivery mode. They're optimized for delivery. And it's assumed that the function of the product manager is to feed them with what they need in order to execute at maximal capacity. So uh, a perfectly prioritized product backlog, user stories, attendance in planifications, in stand-ups, in retrospectives. The PM needs to spend an immense amount of time supporting the team to ensure that they are delivering constantly. And for me, this is an anti-pattern. That's not really what product management is about. Uh, product management is about actually bringing developers out of this mode and bringing them with you on the journey of discovery, turning them into part of the discovery process, telling them that their responsibility is not just to write code and push it to production, but to actually discover what's the right thing to do. And that's what we do in the task layer. We're kind of changing the game a little bit and we're telling them we're not just focusing on sprints or on moving tickets to the done state, we're focusing on steps. And the success of a step doesn't end when the code for the step is ready. The step is, is a very short thing. You know, in six weeks, we're going to run this usability test with 12 participants. In eight weeks, we need to run a longitudinal study with 200 participants. What do we do? Let's talk together. Here are the assumptions we want to validate. What can we build that we can give them that is good enough that we can accomplish it within this very constrained time frame? How do we test? What data should we collect? How do we an analyze this data? These are all great questions that engineers and designers are very happy to participate in, and they have in immense insight. So you need to bring them along, and they love it because the project becomes much more dynamic. It's not just about give me the requirements and I will write them, but it's more about let's keep launching these things and learning and see what works and iterate. It's so much more exciting. Once you work this way, you don't want to go back. So changing that alleviates a lot of the load on PMs because once you give the, the engineers and the designers the context and you bring them in, into the discovery process, you don't need to tell them as much. And honestly, in, in Google, most of the time, I didn't have to tell my engineers whether this pixel is blue or purple, or whether the behavior is exactly like this, or definition of done is that. They figured it out. They called me to their desk and showed me stuff and said, what do you think? And that's the way you need to work, really. It, it doesn't scale otherwise. That sounds quite empowering for the engineers in particular. Uh, in that sense, and moving away from the traditional agile approach of, as you said, the, the PMs f feed um, the tickets into the board, there's acceptance criteria, click done onto the next one. Um, yeah, bringing the engineering and other people into the discovery process. And from the actual visual perspective, is it, I, I think in the book you have you, you sort of goals, it's literally the goals on the left all the way through to the tasks on the right hand side. Um, I think you mentioned also the Kanban approach in terms of the tasks and how you manage that. Is that is it kind of multiple levels of a board? You have your gist board and then you have a different board, which kind of is the the tasks fed from the, the steps. Is that how that typically works? Uh, yes. What I notice is that the way companies manage the work is they have these high-level roadmaps or and OKRs, and then it drops directly to the task level, the sprints, the the tickets, the and in the middle, you have a product backlog that's supposed to connect everything, but it's it's very, very, it's too fine-grained. People are missing the bigger picture. And I think we're missing some layers in the middle. So that's what GIST is supposed to do. So there's the goals, ideas, and steps. And the team needs to be constantly made aware of them. So I suggest just putting them all on one board and saying, this quarter, we committed to these three key results. Here they are. Every two weeks we meet just to ask ourselves, how are we doing on them? Because otherwise we'll not achieve them. Next to them are the ideas we're currently pursuing. And there's always more than one idea. We should be testing multiple. Um, and here's the situation with them. This is what we know. And here are the next steps for each idea. 
And then that's the bulk of the discussion. This is a this is kind of a bi-weekly status meeting that you should have with your team for 30 minutes. How are we doing on the steps? And sometimes you will realize some of the most important steps are being delayed because of lack of resources or bottlenecks. So people can shuffle and help and put other steps aside. That becomes kind of the, the unit of project management in a sense, instead of doing things in a sprint. A sprint is often, I'm sorry to say, meaningless. It's, it's a unit of work, uh, but uh, uh, a step has a meaning. We're trying to build and learn to a certain degree about a specific idea that is connected to our goals. So having this discussion and showing the, the entire set of things, including, the, by the way, engineering and design ideas, because I don't think it should be just about product uh, and business stuff. Um, having this discussion with everyone and I, I assure you they will complain if you do this regular meeting but this is a minute meeting that will save your life they get so much context they understand again what they're expected to achieve this quarter which is the goals not the delivery they understand how the steps are going how the ideas are evaluated it makes life easier then they can go into planification or whatever you call your uh, agile planning process and um, it will go much smoother. They they will not need all this, you know, grooming and extra massaging of the stories. They will understand what they need to do. What I really like about the, this particular framework is you have someone working on a specific task and they're saying, why am I doing this task? And you can say, well, it's part of this step in terms of the, the various breakdowns and that's why we're doing it. And they say, okay, why are we doing this step? Well, we had this idea to solve this problem. Um, and why are we doing that idea? Because it contributes to this key goal. And why are we doing that goal? Because that goal contributes ultimately to the uh, the North Stars, the top business metrics. So all the way down to the granular stuff, you can bring it back all the way to your top level goals. And I think that's a, a really good way to improve transparency across the business. And it's something that I certainly struggle with to understand or explain why we're doing certain things to certain people at certain times. It's uh, It can be quite challenging. So it's a great way to formulate that that thinking and visualize it as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, stop anyone in the hallway in your company, ask them, why are we working on this project? And nine out of 10 times, they will say, because someone told me to do it. That's it. And if you switch to this more agile, lean mode of work, um, first, you allow more ideas to come in. So it's not just the prerogative of the big boys to choose which ideas go. We just allow many more ideas, and some of these ideas will come bottom up from the team itself. So it's very empowering for them to see two weeks ago, they came up with this idea, and now it's being actually tested. And uh, it's also very sobering for a lot of people to see how their ideas are testing. They think it's a great idea, but then you come to them a couple of weeks later, here's some evidence. Turns out very few people actually resonate with your idea, and that's... That's a really good positive thing for people to hear sometimes. Uh, so it it really changes the dynamic inside the company if you're able to get it to work. If you're a let's say PM or even engineer or designer, um, mm -hmm. you read evidence guided and you're thinking, well, it's quite different to how we do things at the moment at the company. So where do I even begin? What what do I what, what do I start with the leadership to try and suggest we do things slightly differently? Is there a do you, do you do you say, hey, you know, start with the goals, maybe we can try and articulate things better there, or um, I'm assuming it's probably different for every company, but is it generally speaking in a maybe a smaller company, how, how would you go about talking to leadership about changing some of the ways of doing, do, doing the work to, to become evidence-guided? That is the number one challenge uh, in this book and every other uh, book on the topic, by the way, um, adoption. How do we drive adoption within our companies? And often the product people are the change agents. They are the ones that see the problem most acutely. They are the ones who are trying to move to a more modern way. They are the ones reading the books. Um, I, I dedicated an entire chapter, chapter nine, to adoption. But I would lie if I say that I found some magic solution that you just wave a wand and it just comes together. Partly because every company is a little bit different and every company has its own little biases towards certain ways of working. So you need to start by understanding how big is the gap between where you want to be and where your company is. If your company is very traditional, very top-down, very output-oriented, 
you have a quite a long way to go. What I would suggest is try to look at the model, goals, ideas, steps, and tasks, and ask yourself, where is the biggest problem right now? Are we struggling with defining good goals? Are we prioritizing poorly? Or are we uh, not learning? We're just building, but not learning. Or is it because we're too kind of, the team is too disconnected from the realities of the business and the users and just uh, about churning code? You can start the process or start the adoption in each of the layers separately. And I've done this with a number of companies. Um, and other success patterns are finding a partner at the C level. So someone, usually the CPO, sometimes the CTO, sometimes it's someone else. Understand the topic, give them the book, invite me to speak with your executives. I do this sometimes. Or find someone else too. There, there are many, many good coaches on this topic. But sell them on the idea and get them to promote it within the C, uh, the C panel. and get everyone else to 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 see that it's a serious thing that the company really wants to work this way and then you want to carve out some area where you can really try it out with without compromises you're really trying to adopt the new model and give yourself some breath so a couple of quarters this group of product teams are going to try to this way and share share success stories immediately as they happen and again it's hard, but it's possible to drive this change gradually within the company. It's, it's a bit meta, but I think ultimately you need to prove that through evidence, <laughs> to apply evidence guide into the company. In my case, actually, the very first thing I did was bring in the, the confidence calculator model and started using that to uh, supplement our understanding of what good ideas are and how confident we are in executing them. So that's, for me, a really good starting point in terms of our business and proving the value in that over time, hopefully will then enable some other areas of the the framework to be implemented and um, get that buy-in from the people who you have to get that buy-in from yeah i'm an engineer so i think in my perspective philosophical discussion convincing others that your philosophy is better is unlikely to work but if you bring in actual things actual tools actual frameworks that you can put in place show them how it will work and especially be very transparent about the results. So surface evidence constantly. Tell them, we tested it, we learned this thing. What do you think about your idea now? This builds trust. And this is a key, key element in success. So, um, they need to trust the product team to be able to guide itself towards the business goals, which is a really big stretch for them. They're not used to work this way. So you need to show them how it works. And you need to let them feel that they have a, a way to to be part of it. And you need to let them know that you're not just going to launch stupid stuff without consulting them, because that will be the end of the process. Well, um, Itamar, it's been fascinating. I think it's a great point to end on. And hopefully people will uh, be inspired enough to find out a bit more about yourself, by the book possibly as well. Um, I certainly recommend it. It's been a great read for me. So. Uh, thank you very much for joining the podcast and you know taking the time to speak to us. For sure. If anyone's interested, just visit evidenceguided, one word, uh, dot com, and you can find a book there. Excellent. Well, um, yeah, thanks again and uh, speak soon. Thanks, Itzma. Thank you. You've been listening to the Product Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to leave a follow on your preferred podcast platform and share with your colleagues. It's really appreciated and helps the podcast grow into the future. I'll see you in the next episode.